I think it's very different when you're looking at these metrics when your community is just getting started versus if you've been you're building your community for 10 years. So the purpose evolves, the values evolve, right? Every relationship grows and the same goes for your community. So I think it's always really good to then come back, reassess, make sure that, you know, things are happening in, in the right way. And I think that sort of, you know, down the line collaboration between you and the other teams and, you know, sort of working with the executive teams as well evolves uh, just as much as, you know, the, the metrics that, that you want to measure. Welcome to the Community Unlocked podcast hosted by Helena and Olena, where we have in-depth conversations with top tier community leaders and growth experts. Our goal is to provide you with concrete and actionable advice to help you learn about building, launching and growing your community. Today, we welcome Clara Lossard, co-founder and CEO at TalkBase. After more than eight years of working in tech, Clara co-founded TalkBase, a community analytics platform which enables global technology companies to scale and measure the community impact across their businesses. In addition to her role at TalkBase, Clara is a mentor of female founders and an angel investor. Clara, hi, how are you doing? So great to have you here today. Thanks for coming. Hi to both of you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm doing wonderful. I'm really excited for, for our session today. We're really excited too. So many new things that we're going to learn and also the people who are going to listen to this are definitely in for a treat. You've been in tech for more than eight years. You've worked in community for a while. But actually, what has your journey into community building been like? Yeah, um, it's been it's been quite a quite an interesting ride so far, and I feel very lucky to have ended up in our industry, our community industry, because in my opinion, it's one of the best ones. So, as you mentioned, I've been working in tech for actually ever since I started my career. Um, I originally started in operations and uh, people operations, or HR, as we used to call it back in the day, um, and with my uh, kind of transfer role in a startup, um, the founders hired me as sort of the first non-technical person. And they wanted me to help with not just, you know, building uh, the culture and the company, but also building sort of the customer culture. Um, and they gave me the title of a community manager. This was actually heavily influenced by uh, the WeWorks network of community managers. We were also in, uh, in property. We were also in tech. So it was a very sort of, you know, this very huge trend uh, a couple of years back. And that's how I got my first title. And that's how I learned about what the community actually is. Um, so uh, when I got into the industry at first, there were not that many resources around at that time. We started hosting these community manager meetups in Prague. Uh, we ran them with our customers and I made many friends back in the, uh, back in, you know, when we were doing these, these little events. Um, and it's been quite amazing. At that time, I was actually able to build a team of eight community managers all around Europe. Uh, so I got to learn about like leadership and how to like report on community and like metrics like what are we looking at and mm -hmm. um it was it was really interesting i feel like a lot has changed since then and the use case was very specific as well but it was it was definitely a, a fun journey so yeah that's how i got into community wow and it's really cool that from the very start of your career you could deep dive into learning and figuring these things out you know and you were building it and you're actually building a team which is quite a unique experience i feel I'm always very impressed to hear how how people's journeys goes and yours definitely a special one. You've worked in different organizations in community and people roles and were really curious to see what the main difference was between building product communities and other kinds of communities. Hmm. Yeah, I think there is there's always a difference in the general vision and the purpose of the community, right? And there's kind of a different ways how you go about it when you're getting started i think in the end if your community really grows and it you know goes from a couple hundreds to a couple thousands to a couple millions of people then community really becomes you know this huge ecosystem covering the whole customer journey but if you're at the beginning and you say yeah we want to build a product community or we want to build you know, a customer community, we want to build sort of a brand community. Um, you always should kind of have that like first 
um, you know, business purpose written down, the first value that you're getting from the community along with the values that you're providing the community with, right? And I feel like for product communities, it should be very specific, right? It should be very specifically related to the product. And I think for product communities, it might be really hard to then figure out the right value the users are getting, um, you know, sort of back if they become your beta testers, if they sort of, you know, join your early group of couple tens of people and provide feedback and test features, etc. Because sometimes having access to a beta feature, if you are a huge company can be super exciting and really cool. But if you're a small startup, nobody really cares, right? So you have to figure out a really interesting angle on how you're going to reward those users, whether you're going to help them in their career, whether you're going to help and educate them with some additional content, or you're going to connect them with some other folks. So I think compared to other communities with different purposes along the customer lifecycle journey, the product communities can tend to be very one-sided when they just become these long threads of people just posting bugs and feedback. Um, So you really need to be thoughtful about how you're going to provide that value back to those folks that are so proactive and help you, um, you know, build your company and build your product. It's definitely something that we've also heard uh, people say before that sometimes people focus too much on the product and the value that um, the product can get and forget about what the users can actually get from it, how they can be celebrated and what they can get back because it's always the value for both. It's never just one, right? So this is definitely something to keep in mind for any kind of community, but especially the product for sure. Exactly. I know that you have a TechCrunch article posted and I'm going to read your phrase. I think in some ways, community-led growth and product-led growth go hand in hand because in order to be product-led and in order to build an amazing product, you really need to work close with your users. So could you elaborate on that? It's been really interesting to follow sort of the whole PLG trend and watch how it evolves and what are, you know, the the key phrases that are sort of anchored and how companies are approaching it and what are the pillars of doing it really well. And I think there is always a fine line between a, a user group and a community, right? I don't think there is necessarily a definition in our market. I've heard people say, you know, community is everywhere, community is everything. Um, and then also some companies say, you know, it's our customer group, it's our focus group, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Um, but I do think, I still believe that that statement is very true. If you want to be a PLG company, you need to understand how your users think, right? You need to understand you're not handholding them through the product. The product is doing that by itself. Um, And one of the things that we're helping companies discover with um, what I do for for my full-time job is to understand how instead of your sales team, how is your product and your community handholding people through that process of adopting your product, right? So I think in that case scenario, community can be extremely powerful in helping um, users adopt the products the right way, um, learn about the new features, you know, get feedback, think about some of the, you know, workarounds and hacks if the features aren't built yet, right? It's just, I think it really is a perfect place to, um, you know, to uh, to sort of incorporate community early on. And it doesn't really have to be complicated as well, right? We've seen, I've actually seen many tech companies, more of like, I would say the early stage companies that have a tab on their website called community. And if you open it, it's just their uh, possible feature ideas and people are upvoting and commenting, right? That's that like first initial interaction. And later on, they reach out to those folks. They start having conversations with them. They invite them to a private group. Um, Mm -hmm. They start you know, they start connecting with each other and there you go. And there's your, there's your community, right? So um, I still believe that statement is, uh, is true. And I uh, think that community can really be powerful in helping users um, adopt products in the right way. Yeah, I, I have a ton of questions to follow up on this because I think the PLG topic in general is super hot right now, but I think community-led growth, it's like rising star in general. And this is coming, uh, I expect people the same way how everybody like to be a PLG company right now. Everybody will like 
it's already starting like to be also community-led growth companies. And uh, my question is here, what do you think it is first, PLG or community-led growth, or they should go in parallel? Mm -hmm. I think both of them serve a bit of a different purpose. I would say community-led growth, first of all, focuses on sort of the beginning of the customer journey, right? So it helps you sort of get your name out there. It helps you connect with people in a more authentic way. It helps you build those relationships before you have that first conversation. And then there, you know, there's a couple of journeys that the customers can take, right? They can either kind of turn to the community and adopt the product and go the PLG way. They can uh, turn to the product right away and go the PLG route again, or they can go to the sales team, right? And take that sort of sales assisted journey. Um, and uh, I think the reason why it's becoming so popular, we're always looking for repeatability, right? We're always looking for scalability because those are the very popular words in tech. And uh, I think that's why PLG has become so huge is because companies are trying to figure out the easiest way for products to just repeat themselves and repeat the onboarding journeys. And, you know, community can really help there. But I don't think that it necessarily, uh, I think that community can be sort of the assistant, right? It can be on the other side. It can be once you already join, but I think you can have either or without each other as well. So when it comes to community like growth, you can have that even if you have a sales team and you can have a, you know, establish a really great relationship between um, your community team, your marketing, your go-to-market, your uh, your sales team, and that can work really well. And you can do the same for your community and your product team, right? Mm -hmm. And look at metrics like, all right, if um, our average adoption, you know, of a, of a customer takes five weeks for them to go and you know get the the most value from our product how faster is that if that user joins our community as well is mm -hmm. it faster you know do they get the value quicker do they ask more questions etc so i mm -hmm. think there is like different nuances to um to to both of these yeah and speaking about when the founder should really think about community uh building a community should it go naturally should they be really specific and deliberate of okay um starting from the day one like notion for example this is i think the typical example in the market how they start growing i think they have community led growth first and product led growth i really curious about your opinion when the founder should start building community yeah, I think um, whenever founders ask me about how we did things and how we're thinking about our brand and marketing and community, I always say we think about it the best way we can, right? We do the things that we're, that we're naturally good at. If you're a founder and you're really good at sales, um, you should double down on what you're really good at until you have enough money, time and resources to then like expand your strategy, right? Um, I think that's the first thing, understanding your own skill set and understanding the skill set within your team. I think the number two is what is the market standard, right? Like what are your customers expecting? Are they expecting you to pick up the phone and call? I, in one of my roles, I would be on the phone with my customers every single day. Now, if I imagine one of my customers would call me on my phone, I'd be probably really weirded out. Uh, so what's sort of the culture in the market, right? What are your customers expecting? And I think number three is what type of company do you want to build? Do you want to build a company that just builds a great product? Do you want to build a company that really makes your employees happy and your investors happy? Do you want to build a company that has a greater impact beyond what you're building through community, right? And I think that's sort of that first decision that has to be made. Um, and then you really know that it brings value, right? Then you really know that, hey, we our, we know that our biggest differentiator is our community. And we're very proud to say that we're building our community, you know, alongside of our product. Our community is a business community. It's not a charity. It's not an NGO. We're very proud of it. We're investing in it. We know that it helps us business-wise and brand-wise, but we've made this conscious decision, right? We've made this con conscious decision of putting 2%, 3%, 5%, whatever, of our total budgets toward this um, because that's the type of company we are. And I think that's the decision you have to make. And if you feel like you want to go that way and you want to have a greater impact and help your help the whole industry, right? Help your whole market, help your users be better, be more connected, get more 
uh, certifications, get better jobs, and also let them help you, then I think it's the right choice for you to to go that way. Yeah. That's super interesting, actually. And I really like what you said about, you know, what kind of company do you want to be? And I think we don't ask that question enough sometimes. What is not only the value of your product, let's say, but you as a whole, like what message does it bring? And uh, how do others see it from all angles? You know, there is this debate in the community world. Where should community be? Should it be customer success, customer support, marketing? You, you know, you've probably seen different variations in the users of your platform, in your previous experiences. In your opinion and experience, what do you think is best? It's a, it's a really interesting discussion. I think the reason for why we're having this discussion is because even though, and we've heard this a thousand times, community has been around for a really long time, the whole general concept, business communities have only been around for the last 20, 30 years, maybe, maybe a little more. Um, and I don't think the the market has evolved enough yet in our industry to have the right terminology, right? To have the right org chart, so to say. So um, what I think is, I always think of this question in the reverse saying where community shouldn't be. And the most important thing is that community shouldn't be nowhere. Community should not be in silo because if your community is just pushed to the side, if the team is reporting to someone, somebody random, they just have their own little budget. Nobody knows what they're doing. They're called the sunshine people. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, the rest of the team thinks they're just making t-shirts and printing stickers and nobody knows what they're doing. That's the worst case scenario, right? Like, it doesn't really, at the end of the day, and I'll talk about this a little more, it doesn't matter where that team reports, but it has to be a part of the team. That's the first step. And that's the first thing we have to stop doing before we're, I think, able to move forward. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about community, it really touches throughout the whole customer journey, right? I think that's why um, it's special. But if you think about it, marketing touches our customers throughout the whole journey, right? The product team touches everybody throughout the journey, right? You might read a product guide, then you start a free trial, right? Then you do an onboarding video, right? There is like every like every team touches the customer in the whole journey. And I think people need to, um, you know, um, folks that want to build community need to understand that, that it can walk the customer throughout the whole customer journey. And when you're starting with your community and you want it to really be part of your business, you first need to make the decision on when it's going to have the biggest impact first, right? So you need to make the decision on, will our community be helping us with brand awareness? Would it be collect, uh, connecting, you know, industry leaders and be helping us with our top of funnel? Will it be helping us in our onboarding journey? Um, you know, will it be, uh, you know, assisting us with, with sales? Or will our community be solely for our customers and be very connected to our customer success teams, right? Those are like the first decisions you want to make. Or of course, we'll be connected to our product. And then you can decide, is our community team going to report to operations? Is it going to report to go to market? Is it going to be a part of the product organization? Once you grow in the future, maybe the different different parts of community teams will report in different places. And I've seen that already. I've seen teams that have community folks as a part of their whole uh, customer success team, marketing team, product team, and HR teams as well, right? So um, there can be, you can build your teams however you want, right? Uh, but I think it's that initial first stop doing the wrong thing and having it not report anywhere. And then to decide what's that initial priority for you. If you're just getting started or if your community has been around just for a couple of months, um, there is a couple thousand users decide, all right, what's the primary goal and focus of the community? Um, and that's where, that's where I think it should be to, to start with. I really like what you said about these sunshine people. I guess it's definitely it a common situation it's just like the separate entity or maybe on the other hand there is a team but still nobody knows what they're doing there it was like you know there is a, a company that say it sits under marketing but then they're like yeah it's just those people to just have fun and chat to people what is the value you know their yeah. job is easy even like you know it's like what what do you do right when we talk about being a job being easy I actually want to talk a bit about talk base because being a community builder is not an easy job. As we know, it's like a person who does so many things at the same time and needs to have many different skills. When you decided to 
build talk base it's an analytics community analytics platform which i think a lot speaking from myself as a community builder it can be hard to deal with analytics you know okay it's it's it, it feels like a skill it feels like it's hard it feels like okay what is it that i have to measure what makes sense and a lot of us i guess struggle struggle with it and you having you know having learned that so early on in your career being in operations and having understood what is important when you decided to build this analytics platform were you thinking of you know okay let's bring this gift to the fellow community builders who struggle with it and this way they can help the whole business see the value of their work so basically the the challenge that we talk about with sunshine people this is kind of the way i see maybe you looked at it so i'm curious if i'm right i think there's definitely parts to this to my story that you described really well so when we started building Talkbase, our initial, you know, product mission was to make the lives of community managers easier, right? That was sort of the first punchline, the first sentence I ever wrote down that we really want to help and solve. And throughout our journey over the last, you know, year and a half, two years almost, uh, we've actually built several different ways of trying to solve that. We've looked at operations a lot. We've looked at automation. Um, but what we've discovered is that the biggest pain point right now isn't just reporting, right? It's not like community managers don't know how to report. They've figured out a few things, right? But it goes way deeper than that. It's exactly what I was talking about in our last question, and that is cross-collaboration. How can we make sure that community teams are 100% integrated into the whole company ecosystem, right? How can we compare the community's data along with product data? How can we compare it with marketing leads? How can we compare it with sales conversations? How can we sort of visualize and articulate that story in a way that your colleagues and your leadership team understands, right? And that's our, really our mission. So um, that's kind of where we, what we've been focusing on over the last, over the last couple of months and what we're really passionate about right now. And I think there's still so much, like I said, so much to solve, so much to build, so many folks to educate and, um, you know, so many voices to really bring forward so that, you know, we can all learn and, you know, we can really grow as, as an industry, as individuals, you know, as, as teams as well um but it's been really it's been really fascinating um and i think one of the things that i've learned and you know that i've learned the hard way and that i've heard again and again and again that i feel like a lot of folks still don't realize when it comes to reporting and analytics and data and community in general is that you often see community teams like reporting on this huge one bucket of all the metrics, right? All of them together. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to actually um, give community folks the opportunity to split that into two buckets so they can do their day-to-day -day job and they can do their uh, cross-collaboration and reporting as well. So in that first bucket on your day-to-day -day things, those are the things like engagement, right? Those are the things like health of your community, the traction, new users, things that you need as a community person for your day-to-day -day things, right? In marketing, you can think about this like open rates, right? And things like that, sort of this Mm -hmm. tiny day-to-day -day things that help you navigate and make help you make better decisions and then there's this huge second bucket that is kind of you know going towards that cross collaboration aspect of it which is all right how does this general activity of this person compare to their product activity how does it compare to um you know if we have this organization in our community and we see they have 20 members in our community, how are they interacting? If they're a high paying customer or a really valuable customer, what questions are they posting? Are they happy in the community, right? Are they interacting or are they dropping off? Should we reactivate that account? So that's where the cross collaboration comes, right? And that's where community teams need to work with other teams because they cannot be responsible for for the rest of the journey right they have to cross collaborate so that's kind of what we're trying to solve and what we're trying to help our organizations with and i'm personally really excited about it because i think there's a whole other like it's a it's a whole mindset shift of instead of trying to like push these fun sunshine folks away uh it's inviting them in right and understanding that they can really give you the insights that you never thought you could have into um, into how your 
potential customers are feeling into how your users are interacting. It's really unbelievable. And I think one of the special superhero traits of community uh, of community builders is building relationships, right? And that's the most powerful thing you can have in, in an organization. So, yeah. The relationship building is definitely something that somehow gets underestimated or not seen. And what you mentioned about the cross-collaboration, cross-functionality of an organization and working together onto certain goals and not just like dropping it on this one, one group or one person makes such a big difference because then suddenly you see the value you know suddenly if you do invest into these relationship cross-functionally you notice the value that others bring and it can solve so many problems that you think are so difficult to solve in isolation when together it really kind of creates this super team that can move mountains so to speak 100 percent. i love the term super team <laughs> yeah, super team. Yeah, I've, yeah, I just came up with it, but yeah, super yeah. team. <laughs> Coming back to product companies, so you probably saw a lot of examples like how usually product companies measure the success of the community, and my my question is like how they measure, and in your opinion, how they should measure what success means for community in general. Oh, that's a that's a big question. So um, <laughs> I'll start with sort of what I see that they measure right now. And I think a lot of um, a lot of teams I've personally met with still think about that first bucket of data, right? That general engagements, comments, likes, that sort of like what we call like engagement metrics, um, which not always can be translated to impact metrics, right? Um, I think it's a little bit different when we talk about social media, right? Or where we talk about impressions, I think there's there's a different, there's a fine line between when that has impact and when it does not. And um, what I always try to sort of navigate towards is that, you know, when we're, you know, onboarding those types of teams, I always try to ask them, all right, what is the one goal, like this one crazy wish you have for the community? Like if it was magical, what would it grant your business? Would it be, um, you know, the best product feedback you ever got? Would it be, you know, a hundred customers in the year? Like what would this like magical outcome be? So from that outcome, I try to distinguish, all right, this is your community's purpose. Now, how are you fulfilling that purpose? All right, good. That's good. So we have the end goal. We have your purpose for the community. We have your promise and your values for the community. And now look, let's look at those metrics that you want to track. And I think with those impact metrics, those cross-functional metrics, you are able to measure the impact, the purpose for your business. And with those engagement metrics, you're able to be accountable towards that promise, those values, you, you know, the promises you make to your members when they join, like, We'll connect you with other folks. We will make sure you can network. We will give you great content. We will educate you, right? And that's how you can sort of keep yourself accountable. So I think it's a combination of the two, measuring the two, understanding what data kind of, you know, lines up to which which questions. Um, and then uh, always reevaluating. I think it's very different when you're, you know, looking at these metrics when your community is just getting started versus if you've been you're building your community for 10 years. So the purpose evolves, the values evolve, right? Every relationship grows and the same goes for your community. So I think it's always really good to then come back, reassess, make sure that, you know, things are happening in, in the right way. And I think that sort of, you know, down the line collaboration between you and the other teams and, you know, sort of working with the executive teams as well evolves uh, just as much as, you know, the, the metrics that, that you want to measure. You also mentioned the changes in the community and you will change the way you communicate, you know, as any relationship grows, that one grows as well. And this is more of a community building question and relationship question, perhaps rather than metrics. But when things change, it can be difficult for community members to understand and adjust as well. So I'm wondering what's the best way to communicate that in the most, in the smoothest way? What do you think? It's really hard. Um, that's a really hard question. And I think I, I've kind of dealt with this topic when I was in my HR or people ops years as well. And I think um, 
it's really important to understand that your number one change is inevitable. Even if you won't try to change people and circumstances will, will change around you. So you have to know that it's coming. Um, number two, um, you have to understand that you cannot make everybody happy, right? There's always going to be a percentages of people in your company, in your community, in your product user base that are just not going to be satisfied at that point in time. And that can change, right? So what you can assure to do is to make sure that first of all, the promise of the added value of your community uh, that you promise to your users is still there. And if it's evolved, that you communicate it with them, number one. Number two, um, that your business uh, purpose is still aligned, that it still makes sense, that it's still, your the community is adding value to your business as well as you're adding value to your members. Um, and then number three, I think it's about being like radically transparent. And that's extremely hard, but yeah. you cannot be responsible, just like in your personal life, even in your community, um, as long as you're ethical, as long as you're human, of course, and you stick with your values, you cannot be responsible for others' emotions, right? So you have to understand that you are going forward, that things are moving. This is what is changing. And everybody can make the decision whether they want to belong to that community or no, right? And that's what I think, uh, that's one of the beautiful things. Whenever somebody asks me, you know, all these companies already have communities. Why build more? It's the diversity that we need, right? Not everybody belongs to every single community. And that's the beauty of it, right? And you can go and change groups and meet new people and then come back if you feel like, right? So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I also think it's um, inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that all you can do is be like radically transparent about the things that are coming up, about the things that are changing and collect feedback from those members that you still want to serve right? Um, and stick, you know, keep your promises, stick to your values, make sure that your, that your business purpose is aligned. Um, it's a hard one. It's really, it really is something, but I think that, you know, I was working at a company when I started, we were um, a little over 300 people and we got acquired. And within one year, we grew to almost 750 people. So there was massive growth. Like we doubled in size within one year. And you would think, you know, we were these really small offices around the globe, except for the HQ of, you know, 10, 12 people. It was really cozy and really, really startup-y and really, you know, really it felt like a little family office. And uh, once we grew to an office of 50 people, we made sure that the people that we got there first um, had the idea of like, yeah, this is good. We do want to grow. We w want more people like us. This is not some like private VIP club that will not accept anyone else um, and the culture was still absolutely amazing it was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen I have not worked for that company for many many years now but I was so lucky to still keep relationships with those people I I just a month ago I just attended a wedding of one of my ex-colleagues I worked with oh so many years ago and we still have this amazing bond together so I think if you're really intentional with how much time you invest in the community culture, how, you know, how you empower those people that want to drive it as well by giving them the stage, by, you know, giving them the shout out, by giving them the trust, by giving them budgets, you know, however you can empower them, you should empower them. The, the culture is always going to blossom and it's always going to grow. So I think that's another important thing to, um, yeah, to keep in mind. Yeah. And um, the cultural aspect and the nurturing aspect, it's, for me personally, is always the start of it. Then, you know, the rest comes later. If you don't have that, if you don't have the culture, the relationships, the the, the good feeling overall, let's call it like that, the rest is really hard to, to keep up. It will be really kind of artificial and that's hard, which is why definitely the the cultural aspect in, in all ways is, is so important and I can't stress it enough. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah you just mentioned that you are still keeping relations and i think like speaking about like relations and i'd like also to touch the question regarding online and offline because we have most of the communities they are online your opinion regarding the mixture of healthy community should it be 
online and offline, only online is possible? What is the proper mix? I think this is very much dependable on the type of community, number one. And of course, it's really dependable on everybody's preference. Like five or maybe three years ago during the pandemic, I would have hated to like, even after the pandemic, I hated going to in-person events. And I recently attended a conference and I absolutely loved it. I loved seeing everybody in person, right? So people evolve over time. Your preferences evolve over time. I think number one, the community should be accessible, right? So it should be accessible to the right members in the right places. Um, so you have to make that sort of, you know, high level decision at the start to make sure that it's as easy to access as it should be for those right members, um, whether that's online or offline. And then I think, you know, if you're able to combine that aspect in any sort of way, um, it can be really special. Um, and don't get me wrong, there are amazing online communities. that are absolutely thriving and really have a great sense of belonging. There are, you know, in real life communities that never want to go online, that could not even go online, right? Because the way they were built. So I think it really depends on number one, making sure, you know, the right members can access it in the most easiest way that they should. Um, and number two, you know, that it fits their preference. Um, and I think, you know, ask asking the community as you go, if you have been an offline, you know, weekly coffee chat for a couple of years, you know, ask them, Hey, do you, do we want to create a resource hub? Do we want to, you know, take this, do you want to take another step together? And same for online communities, you know, does everybody here want to meet? Um, how can we make it happen? Do we do a big thing? Do we do um, a, a small meetup locally? Right. So I think also asking for feedback of your members as we, as we should um, can help you sort of make the right de the decisions there. So I don't necessarily have like the right, like, I don't think I have like one answer for, for, I think most of my questions, because I think it always really depends. Um, I personally really love a community that's really easy to navigate online, isn't overwhelming, has the right people that have the right intention. So I can reach out to them anytime. They're like, sure. Like, we're in this group together already. Like that's what binds us. That's why we're actually keeping our community so small. We don't, we're not thriving for growth. Our community is gated. So not everybody can come in. And we want to make sure that if you reach out one-on-one -on -one to someone, they're like, yeah, of course we're in the same group. Like we're on the same boat. Um, and I love the little offline aspect of it. I've met with a couple of our members just on coffee. Uh, a couple of our members um, attended our dinners that we do around the globe. Um, they attended our, our live events, right? So there's a bit of something for everyone. So I personally love the combination. Uh, but yeah, I think it really, really, really depends on everyone's preference and, uh, you know, and what they need from, from the community as well. Speaking of the in-person, I was very lucky to be part of the Community Rebellion Conference in June. And you organized it, well, the talk base organized it. And it was so, it was phenomenal. The connections that we built, just the overall buzz everywhere on socials and your community and just everywhere. Uh, it felt, I don't know how you managed to capture it so perfectly, you know, what people needed then. And I just wonder, you know, why you decided to do it, how you built it, because it was a very quick, I remember a very quick uh, initiative, or oh, it took a couple of months, I don't remember, what it meant for you guys, and what did you learn? Yeah, um, it's been one of the most fun things I've got to work on. Um, you know, from my role as a, as a founder now, I my day-to-day -day work looks like emails and then calls and then sales and then product prioritization and then some finances and operations. So putting my community hat back on and being able just to focus on this amazing thing for a couple of months was, I felt so lucky that I got to, that I got to organize it. And I think, you know, one of the things that, um, and it's really, I think it's really hard to explain to, you know, try to sort of explain to people why we did it because we just really, really, really wanted to. <laughs> and, you know, when our, when we talked about this with our investors, you know, we said, 
we were able to run uh, over 20 user interviews in those two conference days. And we talked to so many of our current and potential customers, right? And there were all these businessy things. And I was telling them, but the most important thing, we had to do something for the industry. We had to do something for the, the community. We just had to, because I felt that um, first of all, it would be really fun to organize, right? I just, I just knew that the, the moment you open the door and people get to feel like they get to relax and learn something and have fun and just like have this experience, like that really gave me like the power to make all of this happen in less than three months. Um, and another point was we felt that there was so much, you know, there was this huge wave of, of community um, you know, community companies, community groups, et cetera, et cetera. And we felt like everyone's like making these cheap promises, but nobody's like delivering on them. And I really wanted to create a place that is really there for the people. So when people ask me, like, did you make money with the conference? Of course we did not make money. Like that wasn't the purpose. You know, they're, they're like, how many leads did you meet? I'm like, I'm still talking to people. Like, you know, I, I'm still talking to you. Like I've met you thanks to our conference. And I'm so grateful that I, that I have to, you know, that we have to ha get to have this connection. Um, it just goes so beyond that. And I, like when, when um, I opened LinkedIn, um, the conference happened, then I was very lucky to take a couple of days off over the weekend. And I opened LinkedIn the next week. I saw all these posts. We had over, 300 posts on social media from our attendees generated. And I thought like, this is community. This is exactly what should have happened. This is exactly what we wanted to create. And that was the main purpose, right? Like, that's why we did it. That's why we organized it. That's why we want to continue. Um, that's why we would love to do it again. Um, and it's just this, I just feel like it's our way of trying to empower anyone in the industry, connect the folks in Europe. I don't, I don't think we've had enough because I'm based here and you're based here, right? And I feel like we haven't had enough of those opportunities yet to, you know, be able to make changes and innovations on our continent as well. Um, and yeah, it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And uh, it was, I remember us standing on stage and me saying out loud to everybody when we were hosting it, I'm not sure that the organizers are allowed to have this much fun. Mm -hmm. And I think like, that's what, you know, that's, that's, that's why, um, you know, I think the, the mood was really fun and uh, everybody paid attention and everybody listened to the talks and uh, yeah, it was, it was really unbelievable. So yeah, we got, I think we got really lucky. I think it's also thanks to the attendees, um, thanks to our industry. I've never met any kind of folks than community folks. Uh, I've probably never met a grumpy community builder. I don't think it's a thing in our industry. Um, so, you know, it's a hundred percent, not just us, but I think, you know, um, a, a thousand percent, it's not just us, it's the attendees, it's, it's the industry, it's, you know, this general like values we share. Um, but I think that like soul, understanding of why we want to do it and because we want to we want to give back we want to keep a promise and we want to um you know help everybody kind of move forward and learn new things i think that's what really helped us um create something something really magical so yeah yeah it and, was magical yeah it, it feels like <laughs> it feels like you're going to continue and yeah. you are going to repeat this next year we'd love to <laughs> I would, I would love to. Yeah, love to attend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my experience, everything which goes from like poor desire to deliver value and from heart, it always be successful. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I can't wait to hear more about the future. Would like to ask you a question that you kind of touched upon the industry and you know that you want to give back. What is the future of our industry that you maybe would like to see or you see coming or what's the dream? Mm. Oh, I love this question. And, and not only because I think it's a really important one, but also because I've had oh so many conversations in the last couple of weeks with folks that think that things are about to sort of shift and move forward. Um, my general wish for the industry is that we are number one community teams really become integrated 
within within the organizations they serve right that's i think the really important that like basic right um to start with right not being in silo not being pushed away not being recognized less than anyone else um i think number two it's this sort of general concept of being um of community of community folks and teams being able to start organizing themselves i think it may be really hard because as community builders we you know typically organize everybody around us i'm not sure how about you too but even in my like personal life i do like quarterly dinners for my friends and we do parties and we do thanksgiving dinners and you know all these other activities that i probably didn't have to organize but I feel like we need more initiatives in our industry that are solely organized just by the community folks um, because, and we're very happy, you know, with our activities that we're doing as a business. Um, but, you know, we're doing that with the business purpose and we're being very open about it, very honest about it. We even had a couple conversations about thinking to completely put community rebellion conference on the side, maybe even to put it in somebody else's hands just for the sole purpose of it being able to be independent. And that's what I think is going to start happening a little more in the future as well. Um, and then I just wish that our industry is just able to grow and, and flourish and we see more companies and more founders and leadership and executive teams and board members understanding that if we want to thrive as a society as a world businesses cannot just look at revenue they can no longer just look at you know um you know these like superficial goals they have to look at you know sort of the infinite goals and you know the infinite value they can provide so um yeah i think those are my little three wishes <laughs> so yeah. we'll see how it goes but i'm very optimistic um just really thanks to everyone who's a part of the industry. Um, I think everyone's really passionate about it. So yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed for sure. I can, I, I totally agree with all and uh, would like to see it all happen. And yeah, let's hope, let's hope and make it happen since you mentioned that it should be organized by the people. So let's mm -hmm. make sure that there is this bright future. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, on this brilliant note, we have come to an end of our to our chat. I wish we wish we could chat more because you've provided so many amazing insights, so many smiles, so many things to think about that we will keep talking about, and I'm sure those who listen to this episode will too. So thank you so much for coming on and spending this time with us and inspiring us and the community world. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. And yeah, so excited to listen to all the rest of the episodes here. Amazing. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. If our conversation resonated with you, please consider subscribing to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Your ratings and reviews are invaluable in helping us reach more like-minded people. You can find all our episodes and learn more about the show at communityunlocked.substack.com. See you in the next episode.